my name is Venus with Galaxy Inc. And for this week's writing tips, we're going to be talking about world building in realistic fiction. Now, I do want to apologize. I have not been around for the past two weeks because I have been sick. I got some kind of cold that turned into a chest cold and I was coughing and I lost my voice because I was coughing so hard. So there was no video making going on. And then I gave it to other people in my house and I gave it to my friends and it was just bad. So I'm back and we are going to start talking about world building. Now I know there are a ton of videos out there about world building for sci-fi and fantasy. There's a great Brandon Mull video where he talks about how to do world building and, and you know Brandon Sanderson has done one and I know that Ursula Le Guin's talked about it. So many great authors have talked about fantasy and sci-fi world building. I want to talk a little bit about realistic fiction because uh, I don't think people think about it as world building, but it really is. So one of the first things that we need to clarify is what is world building. It's creating an environment so that the reader understands history, context, what a place looks like, the, the, the weather patterns, you know, all of those things. Not all of that ends up in your book, but it's all important for you to know as the writer. When it comes to realistic fiction, I think a lot of us kind of, or a lot of writers kind of get bogged down in this idea of, well, everybody just knows. Everybody knows what small town America is like, or everybody knows what New York City is like. Everybody knows. But the problem is, is they don't. And in our very globalized world, we have people who are reading our books from all over the world. So if you have a story that's set in New York City, don't just assume that your reader knows exactly what it's like. You've got to set it up a little. We want to have those five senses. So when you're writing or world building, think about, you know, what what is the structure like of your town? What is the the what are the people like? Are there are there a lot of homeless people? Are there a lot of, you know, it just feels cramped, you know? And how does your character interact within that world? So I think a good example of a really great descriptor of New York City is Harriet the Spy. Harriet the Spy is set in New York. The girl is rich, so we do get a little bit of that kind of posh, uh, you know, lifestyle. Uh, but she also explores the city and the author does not take it for granted that some of her readers don't know what New York is like, that this might actually be their first introduction since it's a children's book. And I want you to think about that when you're writing your book, you might know exactly what your town looks like, but somebody else does not. I, I live in a big metropolitan city and one of the things that I've discovered about living in a metropolitan city in the south is that my friends up north don't exactly know what it's like and they have a lot of stereotypes and a lot of preconceived notions about what it's like to live in the south and it's it's something that in a book you need to explore that. You need to kind of play around with it. So the first thing I want to talk about is sight. Uh, that is our first um, introduction to a world. Now obviously you might have readers who are not uh, sighted. They might be listening to this as an audiobook. Give the great description. Tell us if there's a grid pattern for the roads. Tell us, you know, what the what the streets look like or the buildings. Is it all brownstones or do they live in a in a rural area or is it more sub, you know, like a, a in the suburbs? You know, I live in a neighborhood, you know, full of two story houses. <laughs> there's not a single one story house in my neighborhood. That would be an interesting point to put in if you had a character who lives in the neighborhood, because you've got to remember that you've got people who are reading this book who never seen a small American town or they've never been to England and they've never been to a small estate and they don't know what that means so you've got to describe it also sounds don't forget your sounds authors forget this a lot don't forget what is what does this place sound like maybe it's quiet and that's fine let people know your neighborhood's super quiet or do you constantly hear not honking and cars driving by you know and again how does your character relate to that do they like it do they dislike it does it just do they just tune it out like white noise i tune out a lot of noise so you know is that what your character is doing with sound you know i i recently uh, have been working on a book and i described the chirping crosswalk signals that's an important sound in in boston because everywhere you go is these little signals that'll go cheep cheep you know I, you know it's been a while since i've been there i can't even do the exact sound <laughs> but 
it's an important sound because it it is a sound that you hear everywhere you go that kind of like cuckoo clock sound yeah that's what it sounds like cuckoo cuckoo and everybody like starts walking when it's making the cuckoo sound it's also for people who aren't sighted i think that that is really important to have in a story because that gives a bit more world building so we've got sight we got sound taste this one gets left out a lot unless people are talking about like cooking with grandma which obviously can be a thing but you know in my neighborhood it often smells like a barbecue on the weekends somebody's barbecuing i don't know who but somebody's got a barbecue out back and they're barbecuing you can smell that food that's a really nice smell to me so you know that's a that's a, a smell that you need to include in there you need to include smells of restaurants or dirt you know cigarette smoke um, I do caution you to putting cigarettes into children's books. Like editors don't really love that, so be warned. But if that is what it smells like, that's what it smells like, you know? Add all those things in there. It gives a bigger breadth and, and a depth to your story. So sight, sound, smell, taste. You know, the taste, well, so I kind of skipped over it, didn't I? I jumped from smell to taste right away. They kind of seem to go hand in hand, and they're not necessarily. Uh, I don't forget that your characters eat. Um, <laughs> I think people people kind of joke around about this in movies where characters like they never go to the bathroom. I think in books, I notice a lot the characters don't eat. They don't sit down at the dinner table. They don't have meals. They're not hungry. You know, allow their, your characters to kind of uh, enjoy food or scarf down food or if they're in a rush. But don't forget that your characters are people and they need to eat too. <laughs> so include that in there. Is, is the character's parents a good cook so they love to have dinner? Or are they like uh, eating at McDonald's every day? I One of my one part that really sticks with me for some reason from Trevor Noah's book, Born a Crime, is he talks about how when he had gotten his first job and he was 18, he went to McDonald's every day because it was kind of this status symbol to go to McDonald's and eat. And even though his mom was a great cook, he kept going to McDonald's. And, and at the end, after like a year of this, he was like, why was I doing that? You know, my mom makes good food. Why am I eating at McDonald's? You know, but that is important. It's part of a culture. It's part of setting up a character, you know, and obviously he's a real person. Person, but it sets up who he was that like, for a while there he was really concerned about the status and looking good in front of his friends and he loved that he had money and he could go eat where he wanted to and that's all important to independence and dynamics so don't forget smell and taste they're both very important to a story so sight smell taste sound and then touch and this is one I hardly ever see I don't see a lot of touch in stories people touching things or touching other people. I don't see hugs and I don't see people running their hands along fabric or, you know, these different things. We touch things all the time. We are a very tactile species, you know. It is important to put those things into your story. That is also world building. You know, if your character is sitting on a bench, you know, describing the coldness of the bench or, or the, the heat and how, you know, it burns your legs and so you have to, you know, tuck, tuck your, I'm wearing a dress, so you have to tuck your dress underneath of your, your legs so that it doesn't burn you. Uh, or you decide not to sit because it's so warm, you know. If you have characters going to the playground and it's so hot that they can't play, you know, those are all really important elements that you're adding to your story. You're describing the temperature around your characters. You're describing their discomfort within their own setting that's world building and I know that people don't think about it that way but it really is and you're creating a world and, and, and uh, characters within that so that people who are reading this who are not from where you're from or not where your story is set can get an understanding of what this place is like and how different it is from maybe where they're from another thing that a lot of people do in uh, realistic fiction is they sometimes create their own towns like fake towns right which is kind of like fantasy. You are now creating a fantasy world because that is not a real town. It doesn't exist. Nobody's gonna be able to find it on a map and visit it if they fell in love with your book. For that, you are creating your entire entirely own town, but you need to have all the same stuff. We need to kind of know where it's located. Do they have cold winters? Do they have hot summers? We need to know about the structure of the town. Do they have a main street? Is it small town? Is it a big town? You know, if you are creating realistic fiction, maybe something quiet about a kid who lives in a, a rural, 
um, town or a woman who lives in a rural town, she feels trapped because she can't go anywhere and she doesn't have a car. Those are all really important elements to add into a, into a story and that's also world building. So what I really want you to think about when you're writing is the people who are reading it. You know, who is going to be reading this story? And think big, you know. I, I know every writer wants everybody to read their books. We want everybody to love our books. I want you to think about who your readers are. If you are living in London and you are writing a story about London, but you suspect that people are going to be reading your book in Sydney and they're going to be reading your book in India and they're going to be reading your book in Los Angeles, California, in the States, then you need to make sure that you are describing a world that they can visualize in their head and understand. And it's not based off of, you know, something that they saw in a movie. Give us the real details. It's okay to make it gritty. I want that in my realistic fiction. I want to know what you, what this world really is like and not the fantasy version of it, you know. So that that's my my biggest takeaway is that you need to think about your readers, you need to think about the fact that people outside of of your area are going to read the story and then explore the five senses and really give the reader um those little bits, you know, and, and again, it doesn't all have to be in there, but you need to know as the writer, you need to know what it's like, what it sounds like, the smells, the tastes, all that stuff, and then put it in there to make the story richer, you know, and all of that that I just described can be applied to sci-fi and fantasy. If you are creating your own worlds, then you need to have all of that stuff too. And then, the last thing that I want to mention is history, because that is also world building. Remember that whatever you're creating, whether it's a realistic but fake uh, small town, or it's a big city that everybody knows about, you need to remember that your story has history. Okay, that not only do the characters have history, but the places have history. You know, the buildings all have history. They were built at a certain time. They have architecture. They have people who made them. Some of them are falling apart. Some of them have been abandoned. You know, include that in there too. Allow your reader to really see that this place does not exist just in this one time. It has a whole history that it goes back and back and back. And that really finishes off your world. You know, so you've got your sights and sounds, you've described what the place looks like, we know what it smells like and the foods and the variety. And then when you give us a little bit of that history, it allows the reader to really feel like they understand this place that, that they've been set in. The one thing I'll caution you about, the one thing I don't want you to do is to just describe and describe and describe and describe, okay? Uh, so a good example of this is if you've ever read Jane Eyre, so we're going really old school, but Jane Eyre has an entire chapter describing a red room. Everything in the room is red. It could be described in about one paragraph, and yet there is a whole chapter dedicated to this ridiculous room. Um, and you can tell by my eye rolls that Jane Eyre is not my favorite book. I'm sorry if it's yours. It's not my favorite. Um, I don't hate it. It's just not my favorite. Um, and it's because of that whole chapter on <laughs> a red room. You know, don't bog us down with detail. Give us what we need in order to visualize the world that we're in without like dragging us down. Cleverly insert those little things, those sights, those smells. They don't all have to be in a big chunk at the beginning. You know, oh, in New York and they went to this place and it was built in this time period. We don't need to know all that then, but we wanna see it peppered throughout. Again, Harriet the Spy is a good example of that because it kind of peppers it in so that you eventually by the end have a very good picture of what New York City looks like and where these kids live and the or kid lives and the kind of world that she lives in. And I think that that's very important to, to remember to not get bogged down in those details. Lots of ridiculous um, exposition is not necessary to the story. Don't forget to press like and subscribe to our channel. We post new writing tip videos every Friday for all types of writers. I've been Venus with Galaxy Inc. I hope your writing is out of this world.